those wonderful toys. That suit of armour, also from TK Maxx. I don't think that... Well, it might be from TK Maxx, but I think that little suit of armour I got as a present from someone. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, I think that one was... like straight out of Dark Souls or something. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think that was a present from someone. The the little horse's head thing on the other side, that was from um, TK Maxx. You gotta have that though, especially next to the Hellboy gun. I know. Because that's Dark what, Horse. That's, that's why I got it's it. Awesome. Because it, it's the Dark Horse. It's the Dark Horse logo. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was kind of official. I wondered if he's got it as no, part or something. It's a money bag. It's a piggy bank. That's fucking immense. You have so much cool shit. I have no cool shit. TK Maxx does. You just gotta know where to shop. I know. I know, I know but we don't have one that's good. <laughs> and it's all TK dirt. It doesn't have It's all dirt, anymore. cheap crap as well. I know. I used to buy lots of cool shit from there. Keep an eye on eBay as well. Uh, but there's a bunch of garbage which goes on eBay. Yeah. Problem is, it's often really nice to browse and find exactly what it is you're after. Yeah. I mean, there was a... When I was out in Australia, there was a... <coughs> I was in one of those little... I was in one of those little arty shops. Yeah. You know, that sells nothing but tat. Yeah. Basically, overpriced, chrome-plated tat and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And there was a... Uh, just a rack of... A rack of steak knives. Right. Just a rack of steak knives, and I was thinking, I really want those steak knives. Because <laughs> they, they were these sort of French knives. They were French knives. Yeah, go all the way to Australia by French knives. Yeah. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Um, but they had these lovely curved handles and yeah. stuff, and this weird sort of like B logo on top of it, yeah. which was done in uh, sort of raised chrome type of stuff. Um, I talked to myself out of buying them. Yeah. And then one day recently, I, I had this sort of itch, and I thought, I, I need to go to TK Maxx. Like, yeah. this sort of psychic yeah, yeah, thing yeah. going on. I need to get my ass to TK Maxx. <laughs> so I went to TK Maxx and I found the exact same rack of knives. No way. For, like, quarter of the price I would <laughs> if, I'd bought, if I'd bought yeah. them out of Australia. Yeah. Plus, I would have loaded out my uh, luggage and stuff with buying steak knives and stuff. Awesome. Pay attention to the little voice in the back of your head. Yeah. Unless it's because you're playing traffic. Then, yeah. then ignore it. <laughs> He's trying to kill you. <laughs> How the hell did we get onto steak knives? TK Maxx. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> Which came from that suit of armour. <laughs> that suit of armour was actually a gift from... No, oh, fuck <laughs> it. <laughs> Not that suit. Again. I really wish I had somewhere to hang these paint- these pictures and stuff. Yeah. Just shitty thing about rented properties. Yeah, i got to get my ass out of here at some point. That's one of the reasons that they don't want to buy anything fragile. Yeah. I'm really worried when I've got to move that. <laughs> the, yeah. the big curio case, which is all glass panels. <laughs> I'll have to empty it out completely and then just bubble wrap the shit out of it. <laughs> yeah. It should be all right, because, like, unless anything hits the corners, but because of the way it's built, you're all right. The shelves are probably more likely to be there. Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd bubble wrap those and just put them down at the base of the yeah. thing or something. But, yeah, if that, if that survives a move, I'll be amazed. <laughs> How did you get in here anyway? Where did it come from? Oh, it's Ikea. Ah. So it came in on a flat pack, but I'd be buggered if I'm taking it apart. Yeah. <laughs> Putting that together on your own. Yeah, but that was fun. <laughs> it looks like it would be fun. That's why I don't own any large furniture, because yeah. most of the stuff I buy is like flat pack and stuff. Is it just really hot or is it me? It's really warm. Do you want an ice lolly? Is that an option? Yeah. Hell yeah. I have lemonade flavoured ice lollies or orange flavoured ice lollies. Orange, please. I'll get you an orange flavoured ice lolly. One hundred percent juice. Ooh. What the hell happened to mine? <laughs> Mask. Mine's got like a little nipple on the end. <laughs> <laughs> you made it weird, dude. And this is all in audio as well. So you're basically just sitting there talking to the microphone saying, Mike's got a little nipple on the other. (laughs) 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 Actually, that talk about Hellboy, so I'm trying to remember when I first heard about Hellboy. Um, I think it was in, uh, I used to get previews, the magazine previews. Okay. uh, Diamond previews or whatever it was. Which, you've not heard of it. I'm not aware of it now. Oh, it was this big monthly catalogue that had 
all of the comic book releases for that yeah. month. All right. uh, well, not just comic book releases, but toys and stuff as well. Yeah. And I used to buy this because I loved the cover art and stuff. And the, I mean, it was all printed on like dirt cheap newsprint. Yeah, I know what you mean. I've, I've seen those sort of things. Yeah. Where are that um, exactly? But they used to have like these big uh, single page, well, single pages of what was being released and stuff like yeah. the cover art. And yeah, stuff. yeah. So I'd buy this and just flick through and ogle the covers and stuff. Yeah. And I think that's where I uh, first encountered a lot of Dark Horse stuff. Yeah. Because, I mean, my comic book knowledge at that point was, is it DC or is it Marvel? Yeah. I didn't really do any of the... Uh, the Interesting. I think I was pretty much always Dark Horse more than anything else. Probably because of my obsession with aliens. And they did the comic run on aliens. Oh, so you picked up the aliens and then so you saw the adverts in the back. Yeah, I used to read aliens and stuff. And then I remember seeing Hellboy in Forbidden Planet. I just really liking the artwork. I just picked it up and went, yeah. And I was like, Dark Horse, they're good. Love that. And they only had the second one. And I bought that and just went, holy shit, this is like the best thing I've ever read. Because I, I, mean, I didn't pick up Hellboy until way, way, way after its initial publication. Oh, it probably was, yeah, because it was like the graph. Yeah, it was the graphics. And it was like, I think it was in uni. So it must have been like, 99, 2000... Well, you got into it before me, then. It would have been 2000... Um, no, post-2001. Certainly. Yeah. For me, so I was really late to the party. But, yeah, I mean, I first encountered all the Dark Horse stuff in that previous thing. Yeah. I don't know what made me pick it up. I think it was the art style. It was probably the art style of the... Uh, I just make notice the first, Yeah. Because it was it was completely different to anything else I'd been reading mm. or looking through. Definitely. So it was the art style that attracted me. That was the sort of stories that kept me hanging around. Because yeah, it, um, it must have been early, like early in the university, because like my third year film was quite heavily influenced by Magnolia. Like the artwork had permeated into my style by then. And that sort of really blocky kind of shapes to everything. Mm. So it must have been. At least my second year. It was the monster yeah, designs and stuff. Monster, and monster designs and stuff as well, like Conquer a Worm. The, uh, yeah. the title of Conquer a Worm. Yeah, I was just, I loved that design. Yeah, that wasn't even out. I know that. Um, I don't know it, so. But Mignola also introduced me to Lovecraft. Yeah, same here. So I discovered Lo Lovecraft by way of Mignola. Yeah, totally. Same here. Introduced me to a lot of cool stuff, actually. It's weird because I kind of found a whole bunch of that stuff that related to itself at the same time because that's when I sort of discovered Hammer at the same time as discovering sort of Hellboy. And I've always felt that the two worlds kind of went sort Existed of hand in, in hand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of Hammer influence in that. And I, <laughs> I, if I could choose any way for Hellboy to be made, it would be made like that. I always feel like his stories are Hammer movies mm. that Hellboy just sort of stumbles into the middle of. Like, it'll just be like a Hammer film. Like, Hammer's Dracula or something like that. And then halfway through, this guy just wanders in in a trench coat and just starts beating the crap out of the main guy. He's like, oh, yeah? They paid me to come here and kick your ass, so i got to kind of do that. Oh, this, I mean, the, 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 <laughs> and you, the, just, you just kind of feel like that's the world that it exists in. It's like, so it's my job to put you back in your box. I mean, there's, there's, two, <laughs> there's two ways I'd love that to go down. One is to have whoever's playing Hellboy... Um, be dressed up in really cheap costume. Yeah. Like, he's obviously yeah, a guy but... in makeup. Or two, do it properly, mm. but have the same sort of 1970s hammer style film grain over yeah, the Yeah, totally. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the totally not paint blood type of thing. Yeah. There you go. There's just something about the way Hammer told stories that feels like the same kind of world. <laughs> Like stuff like Blood from the Mummy's Tomb and things like that, where you've got because it would basically because they were pulling on the same kind of influences, the whole Lovecraftian thing. Like there's there's ones when they did stuff that wasn't about vampires and Dracula and stuff. They did some lovely things like Blood from the Mummy's Tomb is great. It's about this Egyptian princess who's like murdered, and they bury her away, and then. Centuries later, this sort of Carter-esque archaeologists kind of find her and kind of sort of fall in love with the idea of her because she hasn't decayed. 
she's just exactly the same as she was. And, like, the one guy has a daughter who looks exactly like her. It's like she's reincarnated, and they mm-hmm. go about this whole way of in putting her soul back into this woman's body and everything, and it's just awesome. It's really, really cool and really weird and dark and interesting, and it's just great. I mean, there's loads of stuff like that. And the Klanstein vampire films are great as well, because they were based on a series of books by somebody else. So they don't conform to the um, Dracula version of vampires. There's all, like, different... They've got their own mythos. Yeah, they've got their own mythos and their own bunch of... You see, I love it when people, really do, I love when people twist things just slightly so it becomes Like, they have a habit different. of turning into big cats. This okay. just seems to appear in a whole <laughs> bunch of their stories. Instead of it being bats and things, they're usually cats, and it's like it's really cool and awesome. <laughs> Yeah, bring something new to the party. They're just retreads. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, the other thing I liked about um, the first couple of Hellboy arcs was the fact that there was something isolated about it. Everything was happening at the far reaches of the map. Yeah, that's what I mean when I was talking about earlier in the other one about the um, the way I get the same sort of feeling I do about like the old Doctor Who's where you had that feeling that it's, yeah this feeling of isolation and stuff to it. It's happening somewhere and it's just not mm. in the news. It's not such a grand thing. Yeah, exactly. I loved all that. It's like the first one, they're literally trying to save the world from tentacle monsters because you've got what's his name? Uh, oh, God. Cavendish. No, the Rasputin. Rasputin, yeah, opening the doorway to, you know, let like Ogdru Jad in and like but it's just happening in this wrecked old manor mm. in the middle of it's sinking into this marsh in the middle of nowhere and no one knows about it. And it's just like... The old Cavendish place. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of awesome. Those fucked up frog <laughs> monsters are just so good. So horrible. Yeah, stuff's done. That bit where they're like taking the, the mother's corpse down, down into the water. Them, yeah. It's like... <laughs> horrible. I mean, I don't know how much of the series you started to follow, but... Um... It's uh, Hellboy had its own story arc going on, but he eventually left the BPRD. Yeah, that's about I, the time I stopped following mm-hmm. it. But then stuff started to just follow the BPRD in its own little storybook, which yeah. is fine. Um, up until I think it was about plague. It was called Plague of Frogs. Mm. I know of it, and that was when the frog monsters just started to come everywhere. Yeah, and then stuff just started to escalate, and it became a whole global battle against monsters, <laughs> which just wasn't. Hellboy to me. About, no. um, it, it was always about fighting the dark in dark corners of the world. Yeah, totally. It's which like, was more interesting. It was more personal. Yeah, and it's like the idea of it. It leaves you even now with that what if. There's still that little edge of it that the idea that all the monsters and the magic and the creepy shit might have been swept away by man and its technology and its light and everything. But there are little edges to the world, little corners of the room that we can't get into and our light doesn't it's, get into. It's the cabin in the woods. Yeah, and yeah. the things are just there in the shadows and they always be there. And and that kind of mystery and magic and possibility is what made it wonderful. It, it, it appeals to that little child bit of your mind that still goes, oh, what if? Yeah, it was yeah, like, as a, kid, as a kid, it, as a kid you'd see it. It's wonder to it. It leaves you with wonder. Well, as a kid, you'd look into the shadows and think yeah. something's lurking in there. It wasn't an army, it was just one thing. Yeah. I think the problem when it starts to go, turn into a massive war, it's because when that happens, it becomes normal, it becomes predictable. These are the good guys, yeah. those are the bad guys, yeah. they're fighting. That's something you can wrap your head around. Yeah, yeah. When it's the smaller scale stuff, the yeah. Lovecraftian yeah, stuff. Yeah, the Lovecraftian The stuff that's so, like, a mortal mind against infinity. Yeah. And the mortal mind always fails yeah, and loses because you, because you yeah. just can't comprehend what the hell's going on. It's like, oh, God, what's the... Is it The Watcher of the Dark? It's probably my all-time favourite Lovecraft story, where the writer goes to that little town in Maine, I think, probably... Yeah. And there's like this creepy church that he can see from his office where he goes to write. Mm-hmm. And he starts getting obsessed with this church. And he sets out to try and find it. And it's like in the tower of this church, like nobody goes there and there's all these creepy stories about it. And it's kind of 
sort of been locked away. Mm-hmm. And in the center, in the tower of this church, there's like this crystal that's in a little case. And there's like all this stuff about a cult that brought it back from Egypt or something. And when you stare into the crystal, you see all these kind of wonderful, fantastic things, but something watches back. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this thing comes across the void because it knows it's, that somebody's looking and it can see Someone's the light. There. Yeah, and it comes to you and it's just like, you know, that this thing has found a way into our world and it kills him at the end, you know. Yeah, the, the and, protagonists uh, never come off very well in the Yeah, life. and they, like, find his, like, ravaged corpse in his house and no one really knows how he died or anything. And it's just, like, it's really fucking creepy and weird and brilliant. And you're just like, more of that, please. I always forget the title of it, but my, one of my favourite Lovecraft ones um, is the protagonist... You think he's in this decrepit old castle. He's talking about his life in this castle. And he's constantly trying to clamber up a tower to escape, or to find out what's in this tower. Yeah. Um, And eventually, he does manage to make it to the top, and then he emerges. But he emerges out into a graveyard. Yeah. So he was never in this little castle at all. (laughs) He was in a crypt. Yeah. And wow, I don't know that. He, he starts marching across the landscape back towards his house, yeah. or towards a place that looks familiar to him. Familiar but not, I think, is the way yeah. it's described. Because it's not as he remembers it. Because he's dead, like, basically. Dead. Yeah, he's back. basically this shambling ghoul. Oh, and it will, or he's turned into a monster, and he goes yeah. into this place where he used to live, and there's a whole heap of people who lose their shit when he turns up. Yeah. But just the way that story is told. So the idea is, of yeah, doing it from the point of view of the creature is just like, oh, God. Oh, fucking hell. Lovecraft. Wow. I love his short stories. Yeah, totally. His, his longer stuff starts to get a bit bogged down in the um, yeah. the language of the age and stuff. Yeah, it's like I'm not a massive fan of Cthulhu. Like, mm. everyone just goes nuts over Cthulhu, and it's like, it's all right. That's our problems. It, it's a, I, was, I find it interesting because, like, people... I think the people... Attached to it because it's the it's the more accessible of the stories and it's the least it's challenging a, as an idea because like the creature as well is like it's a rubbish design yeah it's just a guy with a squid for a head and it's just like you know that's ex- it it's acceptably horrible it's mm. like oh that's that's grim but it, it's not too challenging to my mind whereas some of the other stuff is just like what the fuck are you talking about I mean mountains of it's madness indescribable mountains of madness was really nice mm. I really like that one because it had the exploration thing it had the hint of yeah. creatures beyond your understanding yeah but didn't throw everything in your face I think the only thing it really chucked in your face was the shog off yeah um but everything else was sort of just hinted at yeah, like in the, at the edges of the narrative yeah and the rest of it was left up to the reader so you knew something horrific was going on oh, and in fact it took place in like the Antarctic mm. Because, I mean, uh, Lovecraft was very good at finding blank parts of the map. To yeah. Put stuff. yeah exactly. there, was, there was another one. Um, this is it. Again, we're back to that idea of, like, it's believability. It's like part of your mind, even though it's like an educated adult, you still part of you goes, maybe. <laughs> yeah, there's that little bit of you that just goes, if that was going to happen, it would happen there. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen over New York City with 3,000 people watching. Well, even I know there's parts of the world now where... There aren't people, mm. or very few people tread. Um, and those are the kind of places where stuff could be hidden away. There was an amazing game that I watched Markiplier play through. I can't, man, I'll have to see if I can dig out the link and find it, because it was just phenomenal. It was like a cross between, yeah, like Mountains of Madness and The Thing. <laughs> And it's like a little first-person horror game. And it's, it's only really short. But it was so disturbing and weird and interesting. It's like you just you just start in the middle of this Arctic wasteland in the middle of this fucking blizzard in the night. Awesome. Yeah, and you can just see this little light in the distance. So there's nowhere else to go, so you just start going towards the light. And you get there, and it's like this research station that's sort of half buried in the snow. And you've got an access card, and you go in. I want this game already. And it's really, really creepy. It's sort of like a like a big prefab thing made out of like well, like a big warehouse made out of all these sort of prefabs mm-hmm. that form corridors and stuff. And as you start exploring, like you occasionally get these sort of weird broadcasts over the intercom system that are explaining things that are happening. 
what could be happening, you know, like, oh, God, what the fuck's going on? It's like, oh, the experiment went wrong and we found, you know, and you're just trying to piece together from these little bits. And as you go around, weird things happen, like the environment slightly changes or bits of furniture move and things like that. But there's nothing overtly horrible. There's no monsters or anything. It just gets creepier and creepier and weirder and weirder and you get, like... Like, if you go the wrong way, it'll, like, teleport you back to another room and things like that, and weird shit like that happens. And there's one bit where you go into, like, the communication room, and everybody's just hanging from the ceiling. They're all just dead, <laughs> hung up on the ceiling and stuff. And it's like, yeah, I'll tell you, yeah, I'll have to find it and dig it out for you, because I, I don't want to spoil it, yeah. but the ending is amazing. It's literally just like, Fuck that! <laughs> I mean, this, this it's just is... like it's so good. It's so good. It's the yeah. nails, the atmosphere, the look, the feeling, and the story's just great. And you're just like, it's so simple and so well executed. And you're just like, fuck that! I, I feel like I've watched one of the best little short horror <laughs> movies I've watched in years. And he's just like, some guys made this and it's free. You're kidding me? Is it? Oh, yeah, right. I think it's like free to download and stuff. Amazing. It's awesome. I have to I mean, see if I can find th- it. This maybe. is why I don't. I, I I only watch like walkthroughs or reactions of stuff I have already played myself. Yeah. Because just in the off chance that I will get around to playing. Yeah, stuff. yeah. I've, already, totally. I've got a backlog of stuff that I bought on Steam over the years, which is like every time there's a Steam sale on, I end up getting a yeah. holy crap for next to nothing. I pay less. I pay more for like video games magazines that I buy than I do for like some of the stuff I bought off Steam. Um, so I, I, I don't watch nearly as much Markiplier as I used to. No, I don't watch that much. But like, it's interesting to see stuff that's out there and people that are doing things well. Mm. And it's like, wow, people are doing some amazing stuff. Get a little taste of it. And it's like that's that's really incredible. And it's just it's lovely. You oh, love it. Oh, it's, it's a, all up your street. Bit of a tangent. Did you ever play? I, I actually don't even know if it's your kind of game. Did you ever play Rhyme? R I M E. No, but I know it. Yeah, I've I haven't played it, but I've seen it. It's fucking gorgeous, isn't it? I've got it, if you want to have a quick shot of it. Yeah, I could do. Uh, well, I'll boot that up. Have a quick play on that. But um, it, it's just, uh, we were watching The Count of Monte Cristo before. Yeah. And um, some of the uh, environments in that, specifically the sort of Mediterranean yeah. type uh, islands. It's weird, because I was talking to Helen about Rhyme yesterday. You've got the sort of sun-bleached rocks and the and blue oceans. We were oceans looking at the video through it, and I just went... I've been to the Med, <laughs> and it looks exactly like that. I was like, they just nailed that whole the Greek ruins, that sort of bleached off white bone colour of everything, and that. But it's all done in this sort of really sunlight. nice shell shaded fair. Yeah, I watched that and went, oh man, I want a City's a Gold game. <laughs> <laughs> they did a. Fo- I tell you what, so did you know that they did a follow up to City's a Gold? Uh, Rec- yeah. As in recently, within the last oh, really? decade or so. Holy shit! And I was really excited about it. Yeah. Until I looked closely at the little trailer that they'd done, yeah, it's three D. Uh, yeah, like they've made it, it's done in three D, but they they used the two D characters as sort of the jumping point yeah, for sure. that. So they look like the characters yeah. from that from the original City of the Gold, but they're three D, and yeah. I don't like it because yeah. yeah, if you yeah, it's either do it two yeah. D or don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah we're not going to see. 2D movies again. <laughs> no, I know. I had one of those questions before was like animated films that really affected you or really influenced you and stuff. Mm. And I rewatched um, The Emperor's New Groove the other week. Oh. Yeah. Is it? Like, and I just like, I, I, I must have watched that film, I don't know, 30 times or something when I was on uni. Because it's just beautiful. I remember I mean, the animation also, being so slick. Yeah, it's also absolutely fucking hilarious, which kind of helps. You know, it's like the I, it's, I've brilliant. got it back there it's somewhere, but it's still film. in its cellophane. <gasps> I've, well, I've only ever watched it once or twice in my oh, life. Oh, that's gorgeous. And I keep meaning to go back to it. But yeah, that what you were saying. I I literally watched it like last week or something, and just sat there going, "No one's going to make this again." Mm. I think the and last it was really sad because it's so beautiful. It's like how well animated and stuff it is. Like, there's stuff they do with the characters' hands and things that mm. just, like, you literally just go, what the fuck? I th- it is so beautiful. The last Western 2D animated film, I think, was The Princess and the Frog. Yeah. Disney. It wasn't that hot. Um, I didn't really float my boat, but... 
I mean, it had it had. There were a couple of moments in it which I thought yeah, that's all right, but I think that was back when John Lasseter finally, first took over yeah. as what was his position at Disney creative director or yeah. something, whatever it was. He came over from Pixar, and worked for them for a while. Yeah, and then he got corrupted by it all, and all the things he promised went away. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to take the studio back to its glory days and we're going to do all those films again and we're not going to make any straight-to-video fare. No, you're just going to release it in the cinema instead as we stare down the barrel of Cars 3. Are they making a third one? <sighs> making it. They've made it. It's coming out any minute now. Oh, fudge. Yeah, so we're Cars, Cars 2, Planes, and then Cars I, 3. I, I it's like, seriously? And we're still waiting on another Incredibles movie. Well, I know that's new. But it's word. not... But it's nothing to do with the fact that it sold more merchandise than any film ever. It's which nothing cars? To do with that. Yeah, cars. I was going to say, honest tra- the guys that did honest trailers did an honest trailer for Cars recently, mm-hmm. and uh, they just said, "You remember Incredibles? You remember all these other Pixar films? Yeah, we're going to talk about the film that paid for them all." Yeah, <laughs> basically. So yeah, I, okay. If you, if they need to make money, that's fine. I'm just not going to go and see it because I watched the first one, and the first one is clever. It's as clever as any other Pixar film, but it's yeah. Set, but the problem it's is, if you've seen Days of Thunder, you've seen. It's it. not even that. If you've seen <laughs> Doc Hollywood, it's yeah, that. I haven't. haven't you? I've never seen okay. Doc Hollywood. It's, it, uh, right, Doc Hollywood is basically it's Michael J. Fox. He's traveling. You got it. No, can we watch it later? I don't have it. I'm sorry. Michael J. Fox is the sh- um, shit hot surgeon. Yeah. Um, or doc- I can't remember if he's a doctor or plastic surgeon. Regardless, uh, he's, I think he's traveling to a LA. Surgeon with, with with Doc Hollywood as the title of it. Well, the thing is, he's traveling to LA to take up a new, really high paid job, mm. uh, and he's passing through this small town. Yeah, and he runs over a picket fence or has an accident and damages mm. a picket fence, and the local judge uh, says, "Right, to pay it back, you've got to work as the local doctor." Mm. Or help out the local doctor uh, for cool. a while, and that's the premise. And he's got to hang around this small mm. pokey town, which he then falls in love with and stays there. Yeah. So that's cars, basically. It is cars. Yeah. Yeah. So not only was it the worst of the Pixar films, it was basically just a rip off. Oh, but like, like the design work was clever. Radiator Springs, all of the designs and stuff like when they look out across the. Uh, yeah, sure. When they look out across the landscape and stuff, and all of the stone yeah. rock formations are all these like old um, uh, vents and stuff. These Who old made car the cars? The, this is the creepy, creepy question. Who are they for, man? Why do they yeah. have seats and all that kind of shit? And there's not a human in that entire world. It doesn't make any sense. No, no. Did they kill so. them all? <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the kind of thing you spend in the longer you spend thinking about it the more sinister it becomes but I, I really don't have a problem with that kind of content being produced I mean yeah I mean it's you've got to pay the bills it's that whole thing though isn't it it's like that film's not made for me yeah it's, it's, it's not it's not made for if me if every now and again they have to fart out a Cars film for us to get stuff like Pixar's usual output yeah I'm fine with that well, where is their usual output yeah, well, that's a good point. What is the last Pixar film that people enjoyed? Well, that, that I enjoyed. I can't remember the last one I went to see. I went to see Inside Out. Um, I oh think that God, was. Yeah, that's right. I, I think that was the that, last one I? I went to see. And I haven't I'm, watched it. I haven't seen that, and haven't seen Brave. Mm, so whatever was before that was probably the last one I saw. What was the one before that? Planes. <laughs> yeah, probably was, was actually. Up, I think maybe. Oh yeah, I have it. It was good. Up, yeah, Up's kind of grown on me. That was, I think that was one of the last really good ones that they did. Brave, they needed to do more with. It It didn't feel like the fairy tale it wanted to be. I haven't seen it. Oh, shit, I'm talking about them. And you, I don't care. Them. I don't know if I'm going to see it. I don't know. It's just... I've well, just sort of, I, won't, I won't spoil it, but... I've just kind of given up. <laughs> I, mean, I just like, don't care anymore. Until Incredibles 2 comes along. But, well, yeah, that or what? Because uh, everyone, I was a, everyone was a fan of Incredibles 2, but Inside Out, people got really hung up on Inside Out. They all said, oh, it was this really heartbreaking film and stuff. You've seen Up, haven't you? Yeah, I've seen Up. And everyone says that the opening of that was really heartbreaking. Not really. No. I, everyone said, oh, I was in tears at the start. Really? So yeah, the other one that people always state for me as well. Everyone goes, oh man, if you didn't cry at Toy Story 3. It's the only one that wasn't sad. Mm. 
all the other two have had something in it that I literally cannot deal with. I'm just like, <laughs> oh my god, the the song bit with um, Buzz when he realizes he's an he's a toy. Like that bit, and he basically he gets... tries to commit suicide. <laughs> like that bit is <laughs> fucking horrendous. <laughs> and the bit in the second one where the female cowboy character sings about how her oh, oh yeah, it's her life, her behind. Her past life. Yeah, like fuck no, <laughs> like yeah. that. I literally, I have to skip that scene. I can't deal with that. But there's nothing in the third one. It's happy. They all end up together, living happily ever after as little toys and are being played with forever. Yeah. The fuck is the problem with that? What's it, wrong with it? It, it was the bit where they were sliding towards being melted down. Yeah, but nothing down. happens. And that's the thing. People say, oh, look, they've all resigned themselves to their fate. I'm saying, it's a kid's film. They're not going to die. You're not going to kill them all. Come on. I mean, <laughs> if they had, I would yeah. have held it up as a fucking masterpiece. Yeah. Look at what they did. Yeah. No, but I knew for a fact, right, someone's going to come along and save them. Something's yeah, going to happen. Is. None of them are all going to be fine. That, that, I mean, that's the problem. How naive can you be? It's like they're not going to kill them off. Yeah. That, um, <laughs> but uh, this this was something... I won't detail it in case you actually get and see it, but there's a character that shows up at some point in Inside Out. Yeah. People that are listening will know what it is. But this per- this character shows up, has no backstory before this point. They just show up. Yeah. Um, and at one point, uh, and at a later point, they sacrifice themselves and they're no longer in it. Okay. And loads of people say, oh, I feel really sad for this character. I felt really yeah. sad when this happened. Because there was no build-up to it, because he just sort of appears yeah. and then is immediately dropped, yeah. I am not emotionally invested in this character. Yeah, totally. I don't care what happens to him. If he'd been in it from the start, if there'd been a connection forged between uh, yeah. a, a, a real connection forged, Yes, his loss uh, or his uh, was it sacrifice it would yeah. have meaning. Yeah, this is it. We're back to that idea of spending time with the characters again. You need that to have an emotional connection with mm. characters. You can't just bring them in and kill them and hope that someone gives a shit. The, I mean, there's got to be a reason. It, stuff doesn't just have impact. You have to build up the momentum behind it for it to work. This is a problem I have with a lot of like modern horror movies. <clears throat> I feel that a lot of modern horror films don't have endearing leads, and that this is a problem. Like a lot of the characters you have in like modern horror films are just kind of douchebaggy assholes, and you're just like, why am I supposed to care about what happens to them? If you don't care about what happens to them, you're not afraid. <laughs> Because you're not afraid for that character. You're not like, oh man, don't go in there because I want you to stay alive. But like, you don't do that. If they're all just jerks, who cares? You mm. just sit there going, fuck it. A prime example of that was, was um, I know it's not a film, it's a game. Was that, is it Dead by Dawn? Oh, I know all of it. Yeah, yeah, like I've watched some playthroughs and stuff. And like, I really had a problem when I realised that I was supposed to care for these people. I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> oh, they're just, oh, they're horrible. They're just like the worst of all the vacuous American teenage characters in a movie ever. <laughs> and you're just there going, why would I want to save you? You're a twat. <laughs> like, you're all horrible. Horrible, horrible people. The only, the only like, I really... don't want to save you. I don't care if the serial killer with the mask on hacks your head off and makes it into a basketball. I literally <laughs> don't care. The only film recently where that's been done properly was... Um, where, the, where the characters have been done really properly was Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, totally. I mean, you say recently, that film's probably about eight years yeah, old or I something. Really... Now. Well, most, most horror films these days are hung up on either jump scares or gore. Yeah. That's yeah, it. Yeah, totally. It's not about... The creep. It's not about. No. It's not about um, atmosphere. No, there's no build anymore. You don't want to dread. Uh, there, there's no cause to dread what's going on. You're just yeah, bre- because you're not invested well, in the people again. Your, you're it's like you don't care what happens to them. Yeah. yeah. But, you, but you're not invested in like, oh no, I want that character to make it through it or anything because I care about them because they're like cool or whatever. Yeah, it's all about loud noises and blood. Yeah, loud noises. Loud noises. <laughs> But uh, Cabin in the Woods, their, their selection of characters, I, I love the way they did it. They had the selection of characters who were interesting and against the norm. Like, this, the supposed jockey character was actually a really intellectual guy until he yeah, got yeah. gassed up. Yeah. And then he turned into that stereotypical jockey. That, that yeah. was the whole plot point. Yeah. And I love that. 
I love the absurd bong that the, uh, the, yeah. the drug guy had. Do you know, they actually made that, it, it and it was really, down really into... hard to make, apparently. It cost an insane amount of money to actually make it work. Well, I, mean, I was just, it was actually the bong thing that I was thinking about. I think, it, was that real, or was that something was, they made apparently. for it? yeah. Well, they made it for the Oh, they film, would have made yeah. it for it, but they could have but marketed the shit out of that. I don't know if they, they might have done, actually. I mean, once you crack how to make it, just, yeah. just fucking make it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. It just it just seems to be a trend at the moment for like a lot of horror movies just to have characters that you just kind of don't give a shit about. I think it's because I, it's the, the the sore syndrome. People want to see bad things happen to these people. Oh, I'm, I'm so so sick to death of the idea of sort of torture porn kind of thing. I'm really glad that that's kind of feels like it's waning a bit. But like, I'm not sure what's replaced it. It, it, again, it, it sort like, of the paranormal activity thing kind of replaced it. Well, we're... I don't know. It, it's more the kind of... It's more films like... Um, oh, not paranormal activity. What's it called? Like The Haunting and Insidious. Those mm. um, those kind of things. Which uh, aren't Insidious scary. Insidious and whatever the other one is. My brain can't, can't, can't deal with it right now. But those films, the... One movie or whatever. I can't remember his name. There's a specific producer who's kind of doing all those at the moment. And they're interesting because they do break a bunch of rules. Like they do do the jump scare thing and they rely on it a lot, but they do some interesting stuff with timing that messes with that whole thing. But they, but they rely on that as opposed to you caring about the character. It's like they rely... The fear comes from, as you say, like knowing that something's coming. A sense and of dread. Don't, yeah, and you don't want to see it. It's not any kind of like emotional attachment with any of the characters. I'm going to refer to... Is it James, James Wan? I want to no, say. I can't remember. The name doesn't ring a bell. But he's the producer who's done like all of those kind of films at the moment. Interestingly, I got to see the movie version of Lights Out. Do you know Lights Out? No. Right, oh it... wait, I've seen, I've seen. No, I haven't seen it, but I, I think I've seen it on the show. What is it? There's a, there was a guy. There's a, well, still, there's a guy on YouTube who did a series of like little short horror movies, mm. and um, they usually star his girlfriend as the main <laughs> character. Like he literally, it's just him and his girlfriend make these movies, uh-huh. and um, it's just in a flat, and weird shit happens to her. <laughs> like there's some great ones. Like she's just sat in a ho- in her house reading a book one day. And she's got, like, an ornamental sort of sea chest kind of thing. And it just opens on its own. And then, like, basically something horrible comes out of it and gets her, you know. And there's things like that. They're like little five-minute horror movies. And there's one that he did that was called Lights Out, where she's getting ready for bed. And she turns the light out in the hallway, and she can see someone stood in the hallway. And when she turns the light on, it's gone. I think you pointed it towards it. And she kind of keeps doing that until this, you know, and this thing's kind of hunting her through the house, and it's fucking scary and it won a bunch of awards in like some film festivals and stuff and um, I think it's James Wan I'm going to say it's James Wan can I correct me if it's wrong Um, he bought the rights to it and they actually made a feature film out of it and I got it in Cenex for like a couple of quid and it's actually really good because I was worried about it because I really liked the short and I was like what are they going to do with it? You know, because there's stuff about the backstory of the character and you're just like, oh, you're just going to murder it and it's not going to be scary. It's actually really good. They actually do some different stuff with the storytelling and they also get the fuck on with it as well. It doesn't hang about. It just goes straight in and they have a really interesting way of getting the adults out of the way of the story, but also not in a contrived way, in a way that actually adds to the plot. It's like the kid's mum has a mental disorder which is also kind of all connected with it which allows them to get the two children characters together who are just like have you seen this thing that's happening and the other one's like yeah fucked up isn't it so we get away from that whole like nobody believes the kid stereotype (laughs) and you're straight into the story it's like yeah this is happening and we believe it's happening how do we deal with it and it's like it's great and it just romps along and some of the, the effects are great and it's creepy and it's interesting and it's like yeah, it's like it, they did something really, really interesting with it. And there are a couple of movies out there like that. But, like, interesting stuff is... I think that's the thing that's happening in the centre 
of of horror movies, like mainstream horror movie at the moment, is the Insidious and whatever the other one is, those two big series of films that are happening. You're not thinking Paranormal Activity? Not Paranormal no. Activity. Fuck me, The Conjuring. Oh, yeah. right, yeah, because they so had like the Conjuring... They did a series Conjuring, of Conjuring movies. Conjuring 2 was awful. Yeah, they did The Conjuring, Conjuring 2, and they did the Annabelle, Annabelle thing. one. And, and, and he's produced those, and I think Insidious. Right. And the whole Insidious series. And they're like, they that's they feel similar. Yeah, that's yeah. like the whole. That's what's happening in the middle of it at the moment, like in the center of the screen. That's what's happening. And then to the other side of it, you've got interesting little sort of Indian foreign films like Babadook. Babadook, Bab- amazing. Oh, yeah. That was that was yeah that was. But that's Australian, so you get this totally different like pace to the storytelling, which things, makes it really. The thing is, that wasn't even really about the Babadook itself. It was about the breakdown of this lady. Yeah, totally. Um, so it was it was a horror film, but it was a different type of horror film. It wasn't about the monster. No. It was about her losing her shit, basically. Well, yeah, it goes back to that root of something interesting in seventies horror, which is the fear of the child. Yeah. It's that whole thing. It's films like The Omen and Rosemary's Baby and um, Children of the Corn and all those kind of things. But the thing is, and, with um, this, the, the child in the Babadook, he was just a horror. Basically. Yeah, exactly. But there wasn't like, anything actually demonic really, about him. He was just a horrific child. There's a really interesting um, sort of document mockumentary thing about um, about it. Somebody's done like a a video essay about how they think it's a um, the Babadook is a manifestation of her feelings towards the child and it's this whole idea of what you know, how the hatred she feels for this kid Growing that's hate, kind yeah. of ruining her <laughs> life, you know, and it's it's really interesting, it's a really interesting point of view on it and especially ties into the idea that you can't get rid of it you know, because like once the Babadook's there it doesn't it's, go away yeah. you know, and it's once always, you've thought about it you yeah, can't get rid of it's it always it's always there in the back of your head things, yeah I think that, having thought about it from a little longer, I think the last horror film which really sort of, I thought, did something new and original and genuinely scared me was It, it Follows. Man, yeah, you're going to say that. <laughs> that film, holy shit, that film is... When, so I, first, yeah, when I first saw it, it blew me away. And um, I advised a whole heap of people to see it. Yeah. Um, and I probably built it up a bit too much for these people. Damn. Because then I sat down and watched it with them. And then it got to the end of the film, and it just sort of cuts yeah. out the way it does. Yeah. And they all sort of turned around and looked at me. Uh, I ang- hate that. Angrily. Because, like, yeah, because if you build it up... <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything to them. I should have just said, we need to watch this, and nothing more. Yeah, it's Not really... like, oh my god, this is the scariest thing I've seen in years. It is the scariest thing I've seen in years, and I can't watch it again. I mean, there, there was a... I can't even listen to the soundtrack, because <laughs> the soundtrack is so... Tied to the visuals, yeah. That it freaks, it's really impressive. The soundtrack freaks me the to, fuck out. Yeah, it, I mean, it's synth. It's so good, it's yeah. all synth. I would never have thought that would uh, sort of oh, bog you down, but it sort of really comes up a whole heap of like retro imagery. Yeah, like the, the twilight orange skies. And yeah, stuff, yeah. And totally. It just goes hand in hand with that. It also has some really beautiful moments in it. Like there's a bit about the bit they use where they're sort of driving through the ruins of um, Detroit. It's really oh, like, yeah. dreamlike and beautiful, and it's just like the visuals in that film. Holy shit! He's done another. I think he's done another movie, but you can't get it over here. I'm mean, desperately trying to get it. I can't remember what it's called, but it's it sounds really good. It's not a horror film, but it's like because I kind of I remember watching that and going, I really liked it, but I also want to see the movie without the horror. <laughs> I was like, because oh, because the characters were great. And it was really interesting, and, and he wanted to see, kind of see more of their lives. And the other movie that he's done is kind of that. It's about sort of teenagers growing up in a sort of dystopia America, and it's like, I want to see that. So I'm going to have to try and get hold of a copy of it somehow. Which is also lovely, because I feel like that thing when we were kids of like, there's movies out there that you still can't get hold of, and there's <laughs> stuff that you still can't obtain one day. Yeah. I'll own it and this, I'll watch it. And it's I was like, like that with I the uh, I was like that with the Adams Family. Oh yeah. The original Adams well the first <laughs> Adams Family film was not released in region two for ages. Yeah, true. And then suddenly one one day it was just on the shelves in HMV. Yeah. And thought, what what? what? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Finally five, found five it. of them. So, yeah. Because you could get the second one, uh, Adam's Family Values. Yeah. But you could not get the first one on DVD. How bizarre. I don't know what. There's a, there's also a science fiction film which is based on a, I think it's a French graphic novel, 
called Snowpiercer. And it's got some really big names in it. Like, I think it's Chris Evans, the guy that plays Captain America. Yeah. He's the lead role in it. Um, and it, it's about this, um, this, I think it's post apocalyptic. Yay! Again. But it, it's, a fro- <laughs> it's, theme, it's, yeah. it's a frozen place on this, like, big train, yeah. which is like, the title of Snowpiercer. Yeah. Um, and I don't know a huge amount about it, um, but it's, it seems to be a, a, a sort of a look at class and stuff again. Yeah. So like people in first class are right at the front of the train. Yeah. They, they live happily and yeah, stuff yeah. on this perpetually moving train, whilst people in third class are down in yeah. the, at the far end of the train. Yeah, eating each other. For yeah, the and there's, so, there's some sort of conflict between the two or yeah. some reason why this guy from the end of the train needs to get to the front. But it, I've seen the trailer and it looks absolutely awesome. Yeah. But it was never released over here. I, I, don't, I don't think it had a theatrical release. No, it didn't have a theatrical oh, no, release. Really. I would have heard about it. Um, and it certainly isn't released on DVD. Weird. But I've seen the trailer, and it looks awesome. Damn. That's it, though, isn't it? You accept that because of the way technology is now, you just think that if it's out there, you'll have heard of it or seen it. But yeah. Then, yeah, it all comes and down to nice licensing agreements. Yeah, and stuff. but then you just like you start stumbling across these things that have slid under the radar, and there's like there's still films out there, well, it, things that you just don't hear about. I get angry about it because it's see. not that it's slipped under the radar. It's not that I, I don't my microphone. It's not that I've been um, unobservant in any no. way. It's because stuff is being kept from me. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like because you just feel like you because of the way. Because of the way media deals with everything now, they, oh, we're obviously hearing about everything. It's like, but you're not. There's all these things yeah. going on that you just don't know about. There's great movies out there that you're just not seeing. And it's kind of rubbish. It's all just the really big AAA stuff that you, you yeah, get. Yeah, it gets rammed down your throat. Yeah. And it's like, you well, miss like, the little bits and pieces. You, want, you really have to be observed. I want interesting and weird and quirky <laughs> and strange little science fiction films that look really interesting. There's one that I've come across. Oh, I couldn't tell you what it's called. I think it's French. It looks French, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. You can usually tell a French film. But it's a, that looks like a really high-end science fiction film as well, and it just looks awesome. I have to see if I can find a trailer for it. Well, I'll tell you what, you can usually tell what's a French film, because the... But Fre- it's got all these like, big epic sort of space battles in it, and guys flying around in cool spaceships, but with, like, sort of almost Napoleonic looking uniforms and stuff and all this kind of and this guy sort of saving this girl on this desert planet and some of the visuals and stuff just look gorgeous. This isn't like, that upcoming Valerium thing. No, this no. is something totally random out of left field that probably will never come over here. Right. It's like France only or some <laughs> shit like that. Do you know what I mean? Or it'll get one day in a bespoke art house cinema <laughs> down in London. But and you, you just you go, usually, fuck, that looks amazing. I want to see this. You can usually tell what's a French film because French films have characters in them. They will have an actor that looks interesting. They're not just a bunch of pretty people, mm. which is what the Americans do. If you look yeah, at a French film, so there's a lot of people who you sort of look at and you think, you're interesting. You're not pretty, but you're interesting. Yeah, you've got a really wacky face and it's cool as fuck. <laughs> yeah. I know. You, you fit the role like a glove. Yeah. Or role fits you like a yeah. glove. And I'm glad you're in it. I'm really happy to watch you on screen. They still cast films with characters who are right for the part, not who's the hottest looking person we can get in this world. Well, I mean, any any American horror film you watch, there's a bunch of pretty 20-something. Yeah. And that just, oh, God, I don't care if you live or die. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. And it, 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 it is really the um, it, it is really the secondary um, the, the bit part the bit part characters well. and stuff. And like my life is really difficult because I couldn't get the latte that I wanted this morning. And like I don't give a fuck. It's like oh I can't remember which scream I think it was Scream Four. Oh god! By the time we get to Scream Four, <laughs> and you don't care about any of the characters really except that, except there's this cop. Um, who's talking about Bruce Willis at one point? Oh yeah, and saying I'm the Bruce Willis. Of the-. Uh, if, if this was his film, I'd be the Bruce Willis character. <laughs> I'd be the guy who makes it through to the end, uh, and then he probably gets stabbed in yeah. the back, and then he starts stumbling down the road. He starts stumbling down the road with this knife in his back. Yeah. He falls to his knees, and his last words are "Fuck Bruce Willis." And he just falls forward and dies. And just, I want more of him. Yeah. I don't care about the, the, the pretty girls in the fraternity house. I yeah. don't give a rat's ass This is it, isn't I it? I want the cops. Yeah. I want to follow the cops. They're interesting. They're cool. But They're again, funny. like that, that's why, you know, Cabin in the Woods was interesting because he had, like, characters like 
the nerdy girl and the the doped up. You know, they're the ones who survive. Were the guys who made it? Yeah, the, they survive like, and yeah. they end the world. Exactly, and they're just like. Those are the people I wanted to survive. Yeah. Yay! But by them surviving, they killed everyone else. Yeah, never mind. Eh? <laughs> the world was a disease. So it there. can work. You can <laughs> find stuff out there that works, but you've got to dig through a lot of chaff to get to it. You do. 